Good morning, church. Joshua chapter 13, verse 1 to 7. Now Joshua was old and advanced in years. And the Lord said to him, You are old and advanced in years, and there remains yet very much land to possess. This is the land that yet remains. All the regions of the Philistines and all those of the Gesherites, from the Shihor, which is east of Egypt, northward to the boundary of Ekron, it is counted as Canaanite. There are five rulers of the Philistines, those of Gaza, Ashtar, Ashtar, and the land of Ekron, and those of the Ammon. From the south, all the land of the Canaanites and Mira that belongs to the Sidonians, to Ephraim, to the boundary of the Amorites, and the land of the Gebelites, and all Lebanon toward the Samarites. From Baal below Mount Hermon, to Lebo Hamath, all the inhabitants of the hill country, from Lebanon to Misrephah, Maim, even all the Sidonians. I myself will drive them out from before the people of Israel. Only I love the land to Israel for an inheritance, as I have commanded you. Now therefore divide this land for an inheritance to the nine tribes and half the tribe of Manasseh. Chapter 13, verses 32 to 14, verse 15. These are the inheritances that Moses distributed in the plains of Moab, beyond the Jordan east of Jericho. But to the tribe of Levi, Moses gave no inheritance. The Lord God of Israel is their inheritance, just as he said to them. These are the inheritances that the people of Israel received in the land of Canaan, which Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun, and the heads of the fathers' houses of the tribe of the people of Israel gave them to inherit. The inheritance was by lot, just as the Lord had commanded by the hand of Moses for the nine and one half tribes. For Moses had given an inheritance to the two and one half tribes beyond the Jordan. But to the Levites, he gave no inheritance among them. For the people of Joseph were two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim, and no portion was given to the Levites in the land, but only cities to dwell in, with their pasture lands, for their livestock, and their substance. The people of Israel did as the Lord commanded Moses. They allotted the land. Then the people of Judah came to Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephune, the Kenesite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, in Kadesh Barnea, concerning you and me. I was forty years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought him word again as it was in my heart. But my brothers who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt, yet I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land on which your foot has trodden shall be an inheritance for you and your children forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive, just as he said, these forty-five years, since the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses, while Israel walked in the wilderness. And now, behold, I am this day eighty-five years old, I am still as strong today as I was in the day that Moses sent me. My strength now is as my strength was then, the war is for going and coming. So now, give me this hill country of which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day how the Anakim was there, with great fortified cities. You may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall drive him out, just as the Lord said. Then Joshua blessed him, and he gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephune, for an inheritance. Therefore Hebron became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephune, the Canaanite to this day, because he wholly followed the Lord, the God of Israel. Now the name of Hebron formerly was Kiriath Abba. Abba was the greatest man among the Anakim, and the land had rest from war. Chapter 15, verses 13 to 19. According to the commandments of the Lord to Joshua, he gave to Caleb, the son of Jephune, a portion among the people of Judah, Kiriath Arba, that is, Hebron. Arba was the father of Anak. 
And Caleb drove out from there the three sons of Anak, Cheshai, and Ahiman, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak. And he went up from there against the inhabitants of Debir. Now the name Debir from me was Kiriath Sefer. And Caleb said, Whoever strikes Kiriath Sefer and catches it, to him will I give Aksa, my daughter, as a wife. And Othniel, the son of Canaz, the brother of Caleb, captured it. He gave him Aksa, his daughter, as wife. When she came to him, she urged him to ask her father for a field. And she got off her donkey. And Caleb said to her, What do you want? She said to him, Give me a blessing. Since you have given me the land of the Negev, give me also springs of water. And he gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. Joshua chapter 17, verse 14 to 18. Then the people of Joseph spoke to Joshua, saying, Why have you given me but one lot and one portion as an inheritance? All that I am a numerous people, since all along the Lord has blessed me. And Joshua said to them, If you are a numerous people, go up by yourselves to the forest, and there clear ground for yourselves in the land of the Parasites and the Raphaim, since the hill country of Ephraim is too narrow for you. The people of Joseph said, the hill country is not enough for us, yet all the Canaanites who dwell in the plains have chariots of iron, both those in Bethshean and its villages, and those in the valley of Jezreel. Then Joshua said to the house of Joseph, to Ephraim and Manasseh, You are a numerous people and have great power. You shall not have one allotment only, but the hill country shall be yours, for though it is a forest, you shall clear it and possess it to the fathers, to its father's borders. For you shall drive out the Canaanites, though they have chariots of iron, and though they are strong. Joshua 18, verses 1 to 10. Then the whole congregation of the people of Israel assembled at Shiloh and set up the tent of meeting there. The land lay subdued before them. There remained among the people of Israel seven tribes whose inheritance had not yet been apportioned. So Joshua said to the people of Israel, How long will you put off going in to take possession of the land which the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you? Provide three men from each tribe, and I'll send them out, that they may set out and go up and down the land. They shall write a description of it, with a view to the, their inheritances, and then come to me. They shall divide it into seven portions. Judah shall continue in his territory on the south, and the house of Joseph shall continue in their territory on the north. And you shall describe the land in seven divisions, and bring the description here to me. And I will cast lots for you here before the Lord our God. The Levites have no portion among you, for the priesthood of the Lord is their heritage. And Gad and Reuben, the half-tribe of Manasseh, have received their inheritance beyond the Jordan eastward, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave them. So the men arose and went, and Joshua charged those who went to write the description of the land, saying, Go up and down the land, and write in the description, and return to me, and I will cast lots for you here before the Lord in Shiloh. So the men went and passed up and down the land, and wrote in a book a description of it by towns in seven divisions. Then they came to Joshua to the camp at Shiloh, and Joshua cast lots for them in Shiloh before the Lord, and there Joshua portioned the land to the people of Israel, to each his portion. Joshua chapter 19, verse 49, to chapter 21, verse 3. When they had finished distributing the several territories of the land as inheritances, the people of Israel gave an inheritance among them to Joshua, the son of Nun. By command of the Lord, they gave him the city that he asked, timnath Serah, in the hill country of Ephraim. And he rebuilt the city and settled in it. These are the inheritances that Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun and the heads of the father's houses of the tribes of the people of Israel distributed by lot at Shiloh before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. So they finished dividing the land. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Say to the people of Israel, Appoint the cities of refuge, of which I spoke to you through Moses, that the manslayer who strikes any person without intent or unknowingly may flee there. They shall be for you a refuge from the avenger of blood, you shall flee to one of these cities, and shall stand at the entrance of the gate of the city, and explain his case to the elders of that city. 
Then they shall take him into the city and give him a place, and he shall remain with them. And if the avenger of blood pursues him, they shall not give him up to the manslayer, in, the manslayer into his hand, because he struck his neighbour unknowingly, and did not hate him in the past. And he shall remain in that city until he has stood before the congregation for judgment, until the death of, of him who is high priest at the time. Then the manslayer may return to his own town and his own home, to the town from which he fled. So they set apart Kadesh in Galilee in the hill country of Naphtali, and Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim, and Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the hill country of Judah. And beyond the Jordan east of Jericho, they appointed Bezer in the wilderness of the tableland, from the tribe of Reuben, and Ramoth in Gilead, from the tribe of Gad, and Golan in Bashan, from the tribe of Manasseh. These were the cities designated for all the people of Israel and for the strangers sojourning among them, that anyone who killed a person without intent could flee there, so that he might not die by the hand of the avenger of blood till he stood before the congregation. Then the heads of the fathers' houses of the Levites came to Eleazar the priest, and to Joshua the son of Nun, and to the heads of the fathers' houses of the tribes of the people of Israel. And they said to them at Shiloh in the land of Canaan, The Lord commanded through Moses that we be given cities to dwell in, along with their pasturelands for our livestock. So by command of the Lord, the people of Israel gave to the Levites the following cities and pasturelands out of their inheritance. Joshua chapter 21, verses 43 to 45. Thus the Lord gave to Israel all the land that he swore to give to their fathers, and they took possession of it and settled there. And the Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their fathers. Not one of all their enemies had withstood them, for the Lord had given all their enemies into their hands. Not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass. This is the word of the Lord. Well, thank you very, very much, Freddie and Naku, for that uh, reading. And it's a joy uh, to be with you here this morning. My name is Nate, uh, and I'm one of the elders here. Uh, I'll say very, um, yeah, very special thank you to um, so many of you. It's been a while since I've been out here, but many of you have prayed um, since my accident. And so it is a joy to be here uh, with you. But the most important thing is that we are looking at God's Word this morning. And we need God's help to do that. And so let's pray as we turn to God's Word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity for us to look at what your word says to us, how it applies to our lives, how it gives us the greatest news we could ever receive. Lord, we pray that you would be with us, we pray that you would speak to us through your word. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, well if I could give you uh, land, if I could give you possession of land, how much would you want? Let's say you live at home, okay, instantly, that, that's not a thing anymore, you, you can move out. Uh, maybe, maybe you're a child and you still live with your parents, well actually no, you, you can have a house, you can have your own house. Maybe you need someone who will be able to cook for you, but you can have your own property. Maybe you are living in a flat right now and you think, you know what, I'd just absolutely love to have one extra floor done. I'll give you that extra floor. Or maybe you're thinking, actually I'd really like a garden. Done, you can have that garden, as big as you want it to be. Or maybe you're in a house, uh, and you're in the house, and you think, you know what, a couple of extra rooms would be great. Done. Loft conversion, you want it. Uh, maybe a, a little extension out the back, well, I'll give it to you straight away. Maybe, actually, though, you're in your house, and you're thinking, actually, I've got the house, and I've got the rooms, everyone has a different room, and, and I've got the garden. If you've got that in London, wow, well done. I don't know how you've done that, but maybe you've got that. Well, well actually, no, I can give you even more. What are we talking about? Maybe I'll give you a mansion. Maybe you can go out into, into Surrey, which is the greatest county in the whole of England, and you can have the mansion with room after room after room and a massive, massive garden. Maybe you can have that. I can give you even more. Maybe I'll give you a castle. And you have this castle and there's room after room after room and you have staff that work all through them. And you have just this land that spreads as far as the eye can see. And, and, and there's woods. And, and, and there's lakes. And, and there's ponds and there's wildlife. And every time you look, you can just see, oh, that's another field that belongs to me. 
Oh, that's another one that belongs to me. Maybe you even own part of the local town. Maybe you, you own some of the shops or, or some of the pubs. And, and just everywhere you look, it is all yours. Imagine that that was possible. Is that something that you would want, if, if that could be offered to you? Well, we see, in many senses, we can only imagine this, right? And, and we spend so much of our lives probably just wanting, quite often, just that little bit extra. Just, just maybe that extra room or that extra little bit of garden space. Or, or maybe one day we want to just move out slightly so that we can have a little bit more space. But there also is a dream going on in the back of our minds at the same time of if imagine that we can have even more. Imagine we could have that massive, massive mansion. Imagine we could have that house that maybe we just driven past one time. It just looks incredible. Imagine we could have all of that land. Imagine that we could inherit it. But, but is that just a dream? Is that just a dream that we will just always have in our lives? You see, if that, was actually, if that was actually possible, would you not be interested in inheriting it? Would, would you not want to, to do what you can to make sure that you could inherit that incredible inheritance? Well, this morning we're looking in this massive passage uh, about the glorious inheritance that God's people were given. And we'll also see how it links not only to the glorious inheritance that they had, but also the glorious inheritance that we can have as well. But, but let's do some work, because at the start of the Bible, right at the start of Genesis 1, we see that God creates the entire world. And this really interesting thing happens, because he creates mankind and he puts them in a garden. You see, they've received an incredible inheritance. As far as the eye can see, it all belongs to them. And the best thing about that, it is not all the expanse of, of inheritance that they have in terms of land, but it also is the fact that they have God in, and they are in God's presence. They actually know what it's like to, to be with God and to, to walk with God and to have perfect union with Him. But as we know in the Bible what happens, mankind turns away from God. That They shun Him, they reject Him, they rebel Him, they don't want His good gifts. And the result of that is that mankind are cast out of the garden. You see, their inheritance is taken away from them. No longer can they call the garden theirs because they are put outside of it. And the ramifications of that are massive because what happens is not only are they taken out of their inheritance, but no longer are they with God. No longer do they dwell with God. And the story of the whole Bible really is... How are we ever going to get back to that time, to this place, where actually mankind can actually truly have their inheritance and also truly dwell with God? And, and there's this point in the Bible where we have this man, Abraham, in Genesis 12, and God makes promises to him. These promises, he says, one of them is this. Genesis 12, verse 6. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abraham passed through the land to the place at Shechem to the oak at Morah. At that time the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, to your offspring I will give this land. And so we follow through the Bible and we eventually get to the start of Joshua. God's people have been promised this, this promised land, this great inheritance. They've even had to go through slavery in Egypt, but God has brought them through that. And they stand on the brink and they look out at all their inheritance. And what we've seen as we've gone through this entire series is how actually they have been able to, to truly possess that inheritance and what that has looked like. And week after week, we've been journeying through to see what it looks like for them to finally grasp it themselves. And in this long section today, we see how the land is to be provided and how it is to be divided to them. I wonder how many of us actually, I won't do hands up, I wonder how many of us did the homework this week. To read from, from Joshua 13 all the way to 21, I can see some smiles, um, maybe going to guess how we could read the homework. But, but there's all these verses about how the land is to be, be, be divided. And all this is showing us how Israel is to receive their inheritance. And also what it is to teach us about what it means to receive inheritance. So point one today, point one is this. Receive your inheritance with faithful obedience. Receive your inheritance with faithful obedience. So that's the first thing we see in this passage. You see, there's a problem right at the start, isn't there? But chapter 13. Now Joshua was old and advanced in years. And the Lord said to him, you are old. 
as once in years. And there remains very much land to possess, that there is still land to be conquered. Now, I don't know how Joshua felt at being told that he was old and advanced in years, but, but that was the reality. There was still so much land to possess, so much in, of the inheritance to be realised. Israel had begun to, to take part and take possession of that inheritance, but they need to complete the task. You see, two and a half of the tribes had done that already. They'd already taken their land, but nine and a half of the tribes, they still needed to take and realise their inheritance. But God is even clear in this. It is him that is going to do the work. Uh, 13 verse 6. I myself will drive them out from before the people of Israel. Only allot the land to Israel for an inheritance, as I have commanded you. Now therefore, divide this land for an inheritance to the nine tribes and the half tribe of Manasseh. And, and, and throughout seeing this happen, we, we get a picture of what it looks like to receive your inheritance. The, the Battle of Jericho proved this in many ways. If you were here, you, you would have seen what happened in that when God's people are faithful to them, they receive their inheritance in the way they should. God's people are to be faithful, and when they're faithful to him, they will win the battles that he has given them to fight. And throughout this passage, we have different examples of what it looks like to faithfully receive your inheritance. To receive your inheritance with faithful obedience. And Caleb is the first example that we're going to look at here. Chapter 14, verse 6. Then the people of Judah came to Joshua at Gilgal. And Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, in Kadash Benea, concerning you and me? I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Benea to spy out the land. And I brought him word again, as it was in my heart. But my brothers who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt. Yet I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore to me on that day, saying, Surely the land on which your foot has trodden shall be an inheritance for you and your children forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive, just as he said these forty-five years since the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses, while Israel walked in the wilderness. And now behold, I am this day eighty-five years old. I am still as strong today as I was in the day of Moses sent me. My strength now is as my strength was then, for war and going and coming. So now give me this hill country of which the Lord spoke of on that day. This guy. Faithful saint. You see, when, the, when, when God has sent the spies into the promised land, all of them have come back shaking. These men are giants. There's no way that we can defeat them. And, and, and as they said that, the whole of, of the peoples that were there, their hearts melted because they were afraid because these men had seen these giants. And you see, that was a problem. Because these men, it, what they had done is it represented that they did not trust God. God had told them, this is the promised land for you to go and inherit. And yet they come back shaking and, 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 and unfaithful and, and unsure of actually whether they can truly do it. And it shows their lack of faith. It shows that they don't actually believe in God. That they were doubting the power that God had to deliver the inheritance he promised. But, but not all of them. You see, Caleb was faithful. He trusted God. When others' hearts melted, he wholly followed the Lord. And because of that, he had been promised this wonderful inheritance where the land was truly possessed. You see, it wasn't just him, though. Joshua was alongside him at the time. Both of them were faithful. And they were the only two. The only two of the men sent out that were faithful were them two. And we also read later in the passage, when we get to chapter 19, that Joshua also receives his inheritance. It goes to show that God's people are to receive their inheritance with faithful obedience. And we see examples of that today, don't we? We see examples. Some of you, through intense suffering, have continued to faithfully obey the Lord. And you are an example to so many of us. Let me particularly speak for a moment to some of our older saints. Some of our older saints, you are, you are like Caleb. You might be saying, yeah, I'm just as strong as I was when I, when I was that old. You have continued 
through and through and through, faithfully being obedient to, to God's word in trusting him. You are an example to us. You can say along with Caleb, the Lord has kept me alive for X amount of years, and I'm still strong. Mother Peter's is stronger than most of us. <laughs> as old as she is, she's still a prayer warrior. Some of our older saints have gone through so much intense suffering that we couldn't even imagine, and they're still going strong. Faithful obedience. If you could truly see some of them as they, as they actually spiritually are, not just how they physically are, but how they spiritually are, gosh, they're warriors. You would see some of them with, with bloody swords of all the battles they have won, of shields of dents in, have they, have they taken the suffering of this world again and again and again, and they have held against it. Of all the prayers that they have prayed for, for this church and for the unsaved and for their families and those they love and for us, as they have stood in the gap. You see, one sister told me this recently, that she went to the women's meeting, and she was on the table with some of the older saints, and she was struggling to fight back the tears, as she heard of all these older saints, and how they had been faithful, how in their faithful obedience, when, when all the times of suffering and hardship came, they had stood with the Lord. And that is an example to us. You see, what we see in Caleb and in Joshua, we see faithful obedience in receiving their inheritance. But what does that faith look like? It looks like obedience to God, trusting that what he has promised he will deliver. It looks like fearing God and not man. You see, as we look at this passage, we have these different examples. Interestingly, actually what we find is that at the very start of our passage, these chapters, we have Caleb's example. And then right at the end, we have Joshua's example. They, they kind of bracket in many ways this whole passage as two examples of faithful obedience in receiving inheritance. And that is an example to us. Faithful inheritance from, Cal from Caleb that he received through obedience. And Joshua's faithful obedience as he receives his inheritance. That is what we should be looking to for our example. But then what about inside the gap? Well, interestingly, as we look at this passage, we see point two. Don't receive your inheritance with unfaithful disobedience and unbelief. Don't receive your inheritance with unfaithful disobedience and unbelief. You see, the battle at Jericho proved that God's people are to be faithful to receive their inheritance. And when they're faithful, they'll win the battle. But then we have the battle at I. Now, I don't know if it's I or AI. It sounds like we're in some kind of iRobot thing sometimes when we're reading this. There's some battle against the machines. But what essentially happens is in this battle, as we heard weeks ago, God's people were not faithful. There was disobedience and there was unbelief. And because of that, they didn't win the battle. They didn't receive their inheritance. It, it took waiting until they were truly faithful for them to win and receive their inheritance. And we see examples of this in this passage. Chapter 15, verse 63. But the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the people of Judah could, could not drive out. So the Jebusites dwell with the people of Judah at Jerusalem to this day. 1610. However, they did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Giza. So the Canaanites have lived in the middle of Ephraim to this day, but have been made to do forced labour. 1712. Yet the people of Manasseh could not take possession of those cities, but the Canaanites persisted in dwelling in the land. Now when the people of Israel grew strong, they put the Canaanites into forced labour, but did not utterly drive them out. You see, so many tribes, and particularly we see here, the tribe of Joseph, they don't completely take hold of their inheritance because they don't obey God's command. They don't do as God commanded them. It's disobedience. God told them to entirely drive out the people around for a reason. But the reason is this. If the people were to stay, they were going to prove to be a snare to them. They'd be encouraged to marry into them. They'd be encouraged to worship their idols. They'd be encouraged to live in the way that they were living. But God tells his people to completely devote their lives to them. And we see repeatedly that Israel don't do this. And when they don't do this, there is a response. That response is that eventually they become like the, the people around them who they have left in the land. And then eventually what we see is when that happens, the land is eventually taken away from them. They lose their inheritance. 
there's multiple times in the Bible that they lose their inheritance because they've not fully followed through the obedience they should show, just like the examples of Caleb and Joshua. God's people are to be people who completely follow his commands, not just a little bit, not, not just kind of 99%. But God's people are to be those who receive their inheritance through being faithfully obedient to him. And so are you holding back from God this morning? Is there an area of your life you're unwilling to give up to him? The examples can be so clear to see in our lives, can't they? We, we so often can, can not actually want to fully be obedient to God. And because of that, it means that, that we don't receive the inheritance. And so often that ends up us looking like the world. It means that, that we might be tempted to marry in the world and marry people that aren't Christians. Or that we might decide to follow the things that this world makes as their idols. Or that we might be willing to just look like the world because we're just around them. We can become chameleons. We, we allow sin to remain. And where it remains, it can grow. It can grow and grow and grow. And we risk our inheritance. Something like pornography. Or a relationship with someone that isn't a Christian. Or, or idolising money. Or, or all a host of things that start with small sins can grow and grow and grow and can risk us actually receiving our inheritance. And so this passage says, don't receive your inheritance unfaithfully. Don't, don't be disobedient to what God tells you to do. Where God tells you to obey him, be obedient. Because you'll risk your inheritance. But there's also another way you can receive your inheritance unfaithfully. Chapter 17, we, we see this. The people of Joseph spoke to Joshua, saying, Why have you given me but one lot and one portion as an inheritance? And we'll skip down to 16 for time's sake. The people of Joseph said, The hill country is not enough for us. Yet all the Canaanites who dwell on the plain have chariots of iron, both those in Beth Shearing and its villages, and those in the valley of Jezreel. You see, this is, is not just disobedience, but, but it's unfaithfulness, it's unbelief. The people uh, that are speaking to, the people of Joseph, they, they actually doubt God can truly help them get their inheritance. They don't have faith in him. Do you see the parallels here? I wonder if you've made a connection yet. Because what we saw earlier when we saw that example of Caleb, is we had that Caleb was the only one who truly believed, along with Joshua, that they could truly get the inheritance. But everybody else that was with Caleb and Joshua, they, they didn't truly believe it, they were fearful. They said something similar to this. But these people are giants. How on earth could, could we think that we could take the land from them? And again it happens here. But these people have chariots of iron. How, how on earth are we actually supposed to truly take on this inheritance? It is unbelief. That's what the people are doing. They're not trusting God. And we can do this too, can't we? We can live in unbelief. We can think, surely God can't help us overcome that sin or that situation. Surely the promises that he's given to us can't be actually true. Or maybe at least they're true for others, but they, they can't be true for me. You know... Satisfaction in being single, that, I'm sure there are some people that's true for, but actually, the reality is it's not, it can't be true for me. Or actually standing up as I should in, in the workplace, it, God promises me that my inheritance is that I can stand strong, and I'm sure that's true for other Christians, but I just can't see it being true for me. And, and there's unbelief. Surely, you know, we see in God's word an inheritance that he will provide for all our needs, and we might be, when we're struggling, thinking... I'm sure in theory that seems true, and I see that being true in other people, but I just don't quite think it will apply to my situation. It's unbelief. And so we don't step out in faith. We don't trust God like Caleb and Joshua bracketed brackets this kind of passage. And just as though Joshua says in verse 17, we know this in our lives that actually it is possible. In verse 17, Joshua says this, you are a numerous people and have great power. You shall not have one allotment only, but the hill country shall be yours. You see, Joshua has understood it. He understands when God tells you that you can have an inheritance, he doesn't just say it as some kind of joke. 
He doesn't just kind of say it as kind of just some kind of prediction of something that hopefully will happen. Or he isn't kind of just thinking, I think I might be able to help him do it, but let's just see. No, he says it because it's a reality. And so that's why Joshua tells people, you can do this. But you see, this isn't just some nice little pep talk. It's not just some kind of self-help guide or some kind of book. You see, they're not going to help you in life. Eventually they will fall down. And even if they're successful in one way, well, eventually you'll be met by death, which no self-help book or guru is going to be able to help you through. <laughs> but if you trust God, he can give wonderful things to you. But we are to have faith. We are to trust him. We are to be faithfully obedient. We are to doubt him. Joshua says later, uh, we see in chapter 18, verse 2, there remained among the people of Israel seven tribes whose inheritance had not yet been apportioned. So Joshua said to the people of Israel, How long will you put off going in to take possession of the land, which the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you? It's this question, how long? How long are you going to play around with disobedience and, and unbelief? No, be faithfully obedient and receive the inheritance that you have been given that God has promised you. Mm -hmm. We're to walk forward in faithful obedience, trusting God. Not in unfaithfulness with disobedience and unbelief. Just as a quick side note, Jesus gives an example of this in Luke 19. The faithful, obedient servant receives a great inheritance. And the one who is unfaithful, disobedient, and unbelieving, they receive nothing. This even links into the teaching of Jesus. You see, but if we go back to this passage, we have bracketed the example of Caleb and the example of Joshua as faithfully receiving their inheritance. And then inside that we have these different kind of Examples of unbelief and, and of, of disobedience and of lack of faith. But in the middle smack bang of this passage, amongst all these differing examples, there is something that is absolutely incredible. Absolutely incredible. And that is point three. What God's glorious inheritance says about him. What God's glorious inheritance says about him. Right in the middle of all these kind of flowing examples, we have 18 verse 1. Then the whole congregation of the people of Israel assembled at Shiloh and set up the tent of meeting there. The land lay subdued before them. What are the people gathering around? They're gathering around the tent of meeting. The tent of meeting was where God's presence was. And that's what everything in this passage is pointing into. It's the reason for all this passage. You see, God's ultimate goal is to dwell with his people. To give his people a wonderful inheritance. But part of that inheritance, and the greatest part of that inheritance, is that he is with them. And they might dwell in his presence. Remember what I said at the start, when we go through the story of the whole Bible. The whole Bible is just a question of how is mankind, how are humans going to get back into the presence of God? How are they going to receive their inheritance and be at one with God like they were in the Garden of Eden? And we see this here. You see, in the Garden of Eden, it wasn't just incredible that Adam and Eve had, had all this land that they could see. They held all the different animals, that, that they could see the lakes that they had and, and the trees, and they could look at all the land and say, I own this. That wasn't the most incredible thing about what was happening in the Garden of Eden. The most incredible thing was that God was with them. It was just this incredible reality that they could know God. And they could know that they, they were having perfect harmony and relationship with God. Never any regret about what they might have done against God, but knowing his good pleasure and knowing his blessing. Being with one another in perfect harmony. But as I said earlier, and as we know from our story of the Bible, it all went wrong when they rejected him. And so God's plan has always been to bring his people back into his presence. That's why he gave Abraham that promise of the promised land. And here we have it. Right back in the middle of the passage that everything's been pushing towards and pointing towards. We see this. That God has come to dwell in a tent of meeting in the midst of his people. He is the centre of everything that is happening. And, and, and so finally we have this hope, right? This hope that, that God and, and his people are finally together again. The relationship has been healed. They receive their inheritance. And they are together. They, they might have been unfaithful at times, but God has actually chosen to dwell with them. 
what we see in all of this, in all of this, we're repeatedly shown things about who God is. We're repeatedly shown about who God is. And we see who he is through the inheritance that he gives. We see who he is through the inheritance that he gives. He's a God who gives his inheritance, inheritance to be the kind of surprising. He's a God who gives inheritance to the surprising, to those people we might not expect. In chapter 17, verse 3, we, we have these daughters of, of Zelopadad. I don't know how to pronounce that. Their father died. Right? Their father died without a son. And, and so normally, in that culture, what that would mean is that they would not receive their inheritance. That actually it, it would go to someone else. But you know what? With God at the centre of the community, with his people, where things are as they should be, there is this glorious grace as he gives these women, their inheritance. Something that is completely countercultural. God gives inheritance to the surprising and the people that we wouldn't expect. Even the tribes that we hear about, there's a reminder of how God doesn't work in the way that we expect. When he's in the centre of the community, we see surprising things. Judah is the first tribe to have their inheritance detailed. And that's weird. Because if you know anything about the tribes of Israel, there are 12 tribes named after 12 sons. And normally, the oldest son would get the greatest inheritance. If you're an older sibling here, you're kind of like quite happy. You're thinking, oh yeah, I should get a good inheritance. That's what used to happen. The oldest child would get the greatest inheritance. But Judah is the first child to have their inheritance detail. But he's not the oldest. It seems so strange. Why is Judah the first? Well, why does he seemingly receive the most? If we actually know anything about it, it Judah, he, he, he's lived a life where he has sinned at times. He slept, he slept with his daughter-in-law. But you know what? When people turn to God in faithful obedience, despite even the sin of the past, they can receive their inheritance. And, and God doesn't always deal in the way that the world deals with people. The way that we might expect God to, to kind of deal with people, he doesn't always do that. He gives to the unsurprising. Even when the passage speaks about the tribe of Joseph, it divides it into two halves, Ephraim and Manasseh. Again, that's surprising. Why does Ephraim come first? Because actually, Ephraim is the younger son. And so really it should be Manasseh and Ephraim. But Ephraim comes first. Again, it's God who speaks through their grandfather when he gives a blessing to them that says that the younger son will receive a greater inheritance than the older. And we read through that in the Bible and think, huh? It goes against everything that the world says. But that's because the way that God works is not the way that the world works. We look at the way the world works and we see these people that we might think are impressive or might naturally kind of experience great blessing of God. But God, he, he deals with the kind of lowly and the humble. He deals with people that aren't expected. He deals with people who have done terrible things but then have turned to him with faithful obedience. He's a God who gives in, in inheritance to the prizing and the undeserving. He's not the God of the impressive and those that have everything all together, but he's the God of those that he chooses and who trust him. You see, we see that God gives his inheritance to the, the kind of surprising and the unexpected, but we also see that he's gracious. When God is at the centre of, of the community, when, when man and God are experiencing in perfect harmony, we see all these things about God and we see how gracious he is. If you did the homework, if you go to it later, you see as you read through it, there's list after list after list. There's boundary after boundary after boundary. And it's so exciting. Because what we have here as we, we read it is, is if we can take back to, to think what the original readers would have heard, they would have heard of all the things that God has given to them. As we read through it, we might be tempted to think, oh, they've got this place. They've got this place. They've got this place. How much longer? How much is going on? Oh, it's tempting for us to think, well, are all these things really important to me? But as you read this, there's something that this whole passage screams, and it screams this. God delivers his promises. Again, and again, and again, and again, he delivers his promises to his people. Every single boundary line, or every single city, every single kind of different word we see of all the different inheritances that are repeated again and again and again, it just keeps reminding us as we read it that God delivers his promises. Because these are all the promises that he's given, all the way back to Abraham. 
And so finally he's showing his people, this is what you're inheriting. And imagine what the original readers would have thought. This is something that isn't just abstract to them. This is actually what they are getting. Imagine for a second that your, I don't know, great aunt Muriel, who you didn't even know existed, she passes away and she leaves you this incredible will. And you go to the lawyer, and the lawyer has this long list of all the things that are now yours because she's left you this glorious inheritance. It's saying, as far as Brixton, you own, and you're going to also own all the way up to Vauxhall. And this section of the Thames is yours. And all the way into Surrey, you're going to have these lands, the sweeping lands. If you were sitting there thinking, oh, sorry, right? You're thinking, what, what on earth's going on? Do you not realise how much you're about to, to inherit? If, if you're to sit there and thinking, oh gosh, can you just hurry up because I just want to go back into my flat? You've not realised how incredible your inheritance is. You want to go back to your flat, to, to sit in your flat, when you've got this glorious inheritance that's being listed to you. That's what this passage is. It's a reminder again and again and again and again and again, God delivers his promises. And these aren't just a couple of small different promises, but he lavishes on his people. He gives them more than they could ever desire or ever even believe. He's followed through and he's proven himself. Even in that, he provides cities of refuge. If someone accidentally takes their life, they can receive grace and protection, but there can still be justice because he's a God of grace. But throughout the passage, we read about these Levites, and they actually receive the kind of boundaries and the inheritance the others do. And you might be tempted to think, that's a bit of a raw deal. Why, why are the Levites not receiving that? Well, even in that, God is proving himself to be a God of grace. Do you know why he's doing that? He's doing that so the Levites can be spread amongst the whole of the region. So there will not be a single part of the whole of the promised land that doesn't have some of God's representatives. So that people won't have to travel for days to find somebody who can make a sacrifice for them to have their sins forgiven. And so God, even in that, he is giving the Levites to the people. It's this glorious inheritance. But even to the Levites, they actually still receive something incredible. Chapter 13, verse 33 says, But to the tribe of Levi, Moses gave no inheritance. If we stop there, then it would sound very good, right? But then we read this, The Lord, God of Israel, is their inheritance. Just as he said to them. You see, they receive a glorious inheritance. Serving God, it gives them a closest to God, and they experience his blessing to them. God gives a glorious inheritance to them, and he proves that he keeps his promises. Christians, this, this passage should bring us to tears. Not tears of boredom as we're trying to do the homework uh, of kind of reading through all these chapters, but tears because of the repeated reminder that God keeps his promises. He's given so much to us, more, more than we ever would deserve. He gives to those we wouldn't expect to. How much he lavishes on us, he's gracious. Eight chapters of how gracious he is. I wish he was more. I, I wish we had more than our boundaries. I wish we could have more reading of reading how many times God has been faithful to his people and how much he gives to them. The inheritance for Israel was this vast promised land. And so in a sense, what Israel had was kind of physical. They, they had this land that they could see, it was tangible. Well, well, what about for us? Our inheritance, our inheritance comes through Jesus. You see, he came to this earth to share his inheritance with us. He enjoyed perfect relationship with God, but instead of holding on to that, he came and he lived a perfect life and died on the cross so that we could receive in his inheritance, so that we could be able to stand in front of God and have our sins forgiven, and have the inheritance that Jesus has, has deserved. You see, we can be sons and daughters of God because we've been brought in to share in Jesus' inheritance. You see, we have the greatest gift this world could ever have. People in this world might seem to have riches or seem to have property and land or might, you might even hear of a friend that gets a great inheritance from, from a long distance relative. We have the greatest gift that we are Christians because we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. We have the joy that, that can never be taken away from us. We can enjoy this world in its fullness. As we've been seeing in Ecclesiastes, this world is heaven. The pleasure doesn't fulfill us. Money doesn't fulfill us. The job doesn't fulfill us. The legacy doesn't fulfill us. It's a smoke that we're trying to grasp on and it just slips through our fingers. But instead, we have an inheritance that can be never taken away. It will never spoil. It will never perish. It will never fade. Because we can know that everything that we've done that is wrong, 
all the things we regret can be forgiven by Jesus. And also, what is to come. I wonder how many of you have seen those videos on YouTube of, of these kind of tours of the greatest mansions. I, I watched one of them earlier today, and it was like £70 million. Pounds. Gosh, these things, can they can suck in your time. Because then the next recommendation comes up, and they're like, wow, that's brilliant. And they go through all these rooms, room after room after room. There's the underground swimming pool and the outside swimming pool. And the swimming pool that has an infinity pool. And then there's the, the underground car park with all the cars. And then there's the home gym, there's the sauna, there's the steam room, there's a the cinema room. There's, there's the dining room, number one. And the dining room, number two. The dining room, number three. The dining room, number four. And there's the bar. And, and there's the bedrooms with the ensuite with the jacuzzi. And you walk through and you're like, gosh, this is incredible. And there's this, there's this kind of voice that, that comes in the back of your head. Imagine I could inherit that. Imagine I could one day have that. That would be incredible. Think of all the people that I have over. I'll be able to chill in the morning just in the jacuzzi. I'll be able to live life. I'll be comfortable. Well, Christian, the reality is there's something far greater than that to come. Because you have the greatest, you will have the greatest property one day. You see, when Jesus returns, you'll be with him forever. And you will have eternity with him. You see, maybe when we get to heaven and Jesus stands there, he will show us the whole world, maybe the whole universe, and he'll say, this is mine. Amen. And because it's mine, it's yours. Amen. Lambeth is mine. South London is mine. London is mine. Greater London is mine. England is mine. Great Britain is mine. Europe is mine. The planet is mine. The solar system is mine. The galaxy is mine. The universe is mine. Amen. You see, Mars, mine, Pluto, mine, the, the far-flung stars, the furthest them out in space, that you wouldn't even be able to get to unless you went for a black hole. That's mine. And that means, because it's mine, it's yours. You see, one day, our greater Joshua, Jesus, will lead us into the eternal promised land, where we inherit all that God has promised. You see, if you're not a Christian here this morning, that inheritance can be yours as well. And I want to plead with you to receive that with faith. Because if you reject God, Despite all the things that God is offering you, if you say, actually, no, God, I don't want this inheritance. Because actually what's better than eternity in heaven is the things that this world is offering. Do you not see how disrespectful that is? If we're to turn to God and say, I know that Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sins, and you promised me eternity with, with the whole world to be mine as inheritance, but I think that actually it's just more important for me to have sex or for me to make a bit more money, or for me to be able to, to live a life of, of, in, in some kind of way that the world is saying. Do you not see how disrespectful that is? And if you do that, if you turn away and you don't want God's inheritance, he'll give you what you want. And he'll say, okay, well you can have that as your inheritance, but it won't satisfy you. And ultimately you will then be separated from me for eternity. You see, the best thing though in all of this is that if you're not a Christian, you can even this morning receive that inheritance if you turn to him. That inheritance is wonderful. It couldn't get any better. God, God is, he's, he's not held anything back. He's given everything to us. And the best thing about the inheritance, ultimately, is pointed out in the central of this passage, 18 verse 1. God's people are in his presence. You see, one day, God's people can be in the presence of Jesus. You can take this world, its joys and its fleeting pleasures, but give us Jesus, our future hope and our greatest treasure. You see, God's inheritance is the most amazing thing we can ever receive because of this. Because one day we'll be able to be with him and be with Jesus. Amen. Actually, you know what? I can have all of that inheritance that we promised, eternity, and the whole of the universe, but if you don't give me Jesus, I don't want it. I don't want it. I don't need it. I, I, I can travel all the way through galaxies and be like, this is mine, this is my planet. It, it's, it, I'm sharing it but with other people and, and other people around me and I'm with my loved ones. But if Jesus isn't there, then it's not worth anything. But because Jesus has died for us and brought us in, if we have faith, then we can receive our inheritance and our greatest inheritance is Him. He's forgiven us of all our sins. It's just incredible what this ver these verses show us about God. And let's look at the last few verses to finish. Chapter 21, verse 43. Thus the Lord gave to Israel all the land he swore to give to their fathers. And they took possession of it and they settled there. And the Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their fathers. Not one of all their enemies had withstood them. For the Lord had given all their enemies into their hands. Not one, one word 
of all the good promises that God had made to the house of Israel had, had failed, all came to pass. Verse 45, you might recognise it. It's very similar to our doxology. How incredible is that? Not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed, all came to pass. Not one word that God has promised you will not fail to come to pass. It, it's incredible. Everything that God has promised you in the Lord Jesus Christ can be yours, Christian. Mm -hmm. Everything can be yours. God's inheritance is yours in Christ. You have Christ. The greatest inheritance of all. I believe you can have it this morning. Every one of God's promises came to pass. A glorious inheritance. Heaven awaits. That is what we see from this passage as we see the might and the majesty of God's incredible inheritance and how it points us to the greatest inheritance we have, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this glorious inheritance that we can have. Lord, thank you that it is ours. If, if, we, if we seek you, if we are obedient to you, if we look to you, we can have this glorious inheritance of heaven. But ultimately, the Lord Jesus is the most important inheritance that we can receive. Lord, help us to be receiving that and we will be able to be right. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.